This presentation is going to focus on when to use thrombolytic therapy for the treatment of pulmonary embolism. My name is Jason Harrell, and I am a fourth year student of the Wingate University School of Pharmacy. The objectives of this presentation are to define the categories of pulmonary embolism, identify risk factors associated with pulmonary embolism as well as bleeding, discuss current guideline recommendations regarding the treatment of pulmonary embolism, describe drug information about the thrombolytic agent alteplase, including its indications, mechanism of action, dosing, and adverse effects, and to examine evidence regarding thrombolytic therapy use in pulmonary embolism. So to start out, we are going to define the possible categories of pulmonary embolism, or PE for short. First, we have massive PE, which is defined as an acute PE with sustained hypotension, absence of pulse, or persistent profound bradycardia. As a note, hypotension here is regarded as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, and profound bradycardia is regarded as a pulse of less than 40. Next, we have submassive PE, which is defined as an acute PE without systemic hypotension, but with either right ventricular dysfunction or myocardial necrosis. And last, we have low-risk PE, which is essentially any acute PE that does not fit the criteria for massive or submassive PE. Next, we're going to review the risk factors of PE. These include patients who have a history of venous thromboembolism, or VTE for short, a family history of VTE, recent surgery, central venous access, pregnancy, cancer, infection, certain medications such as estrogen-containing contraceptives, thrombophilia, and any prolonged immobilization. In addition, we will review risk factors that place patients at a higher risk of bleeding as these will be helpful in assessing which patients are candidates for thrombolytic therapy. These include uncontrolled hypertension with a systolic blood pressure of greater than 180 or a diastolic blood pressure of greater than 110, any recent surgery or invasive procedure, use of anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy, an age of greater than 75 years, previous stroke, cancer, diabetes, anemia, alcohol abuse, frequent falls, and use of NSAID medications. Now we're going to take a look at current guideline recommendations regarding the treatment of PE, starting with the 2016 CHESS guideline for antithrombotic therapy for VTE disease. These guidelines recommend at least three months of anticoagulant therapy for the treatment of VTE, although therapy can be longer depending on patient-specific factors. The guideline specifically recommends the use of direct oral anticoagulants, or DOACs for short, over vitamin K antagonists in patients without cancer-associated VTE. And just as a note, the therapy of choice in cancer-associated VTE would be low molecular weight heparin. And lastly, this guideline does endorse the use of thrombolytic therapy in patients with PE and hypertension who are also without high bleeding risk. Next, we're going to look at the 2011 AHA statement article for the management of massive and submassive pulmonary embolism iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis, and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This document recommends the use of thrombolytic therapy in patients who fit the criteria for massive PE and have a low risk of bleeding. It also states that thrombolytic therapy can be considered for patients with submassive PE who are judged to have clinical evidence of a poor prognosis and a low risk of bleeding. And lastly, it goes on to state that patients who have a low risk PE should not receive thrombolytic therapy. And now to examine some of the primary literature behind thrombolytic therapy, we're going to look at systemic thrombolytic therapy for acute pulmonary embolism, a systemic review, and meta-analysis. So this study essentially looked at 15 randomized clinical trials, which included a total of 2,057 patients. Each of these studies compared the following two treatment arms, anticoagulation plus systemic thrombo thrombolytic agent and anticoagulation alone. The primary efficacy outcome for the meta-analysis was early all-cause mortality, which is defined as death within the first 30 days of inclusion in the study or death during the hospital stay. The secondary efficacy outcomes were recurrent PE and death related to PE. So before we discuss the study characteristics, it's worth noting that this meta-analysis utilizes the terms high-risk PE, intermediate-risk PE, and low-risk PE. But these are each defined the same as our earlier definitions of massive PE, submassive PE, and low-risk PE, respectively. Four of the studies included in the meta-analysis included patients at high risk of PE. The thrombolytic agent that was used varied throughout the studies, with agents including alteplase, tenecteplase, streptokinase, and urokinase. Out of the 15 trials included, the control agent was heparin in 13 of them, low molecular weight heparin in one of them, and either heparin or low molecular weight heparin in the last one. 
For the primary outcome results of the meta-analysis, all 15 studies reported all-cause mortality. The primary event occurred in 2.3% of the thrombolytic group versus 3.9% in the control group, with a pooled odds ratio of 0.59. This finding is considered to be statistically significant. For the secondary outcome results, PE-related mortality was reported in 13 of the studies with a total number of 1,776 patients. 0.6% of patients experienced this outcome in the thrombolytic group, while 3% of patients experienced the outcome in the control group with an odds ratio of 0.29. This result is also considered to be statistically significant. In addition, PE recurrence was reported in 11 of the studies with a total of 1,928 patients. 1.3% of the patients experienced this outcome in the thrombolytic group, while 2.9% of patients experienced the outcome in the control group with an odds ratio of 0.5. This result is considered statistically significant as well. Additionally, a, sen a sensitivity analysis was performed in which studies were excluded one by one in an effort to see if this affected the results of the meta-analysis. And statistical significance was lost when certain studies, which included patients specifically with high-risk PE, were excluded from the analysis. As a note, one variable that was assessed by two researchers independently of one another was study quality, and it was noted that when only studies of good quality were included, the odds ratio for overall mortality outcome remained unchanged. Eleven of the included studies were found to be of good quality. In addition, safety outcomes were assessed in this meta-analysis, specifically major bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage or any fatal hemorrhage. Major bleeding was reported in 12 of the studies, with a total of 1,935 patients. 9.9% .9 of patients experienced this outcome in the thrombolytic group versus 3.6% in the control group with an odds ratio of 2.91, which does indicate a statistically significant increase in major bleeding with thrombolytic therapy. Intracranial or fatal hemorrhage was reported in 12 of the studies with 1,864 patients. 1.7% of patients experienced this outcome in the thrombolytic group versus 0.3% in the control group with an odds ratio of 3.18. This finding does also indicate a statistically significant increase in the rate of outcomes with thrombolytic therapy. So to discuss these results, the study did demonstrate a relative risk reduction of 41% with thrombolytic therapy. However, the benefit for patients could not be definitively established due to the fact that statistical significance was lost when trials with high-risk PE patients were excluded from the results. Additionally, overall early mortality rates were low in the control group, so the benefit of a 41% risk reduction is going to be small anyway, with an absolute mortality risk reduction being found of 1.6%. So due to these findings, we are able to conclude that for patients with non-high-risk PE, also known as submassive or low-risk PE, the benefits of thrombolytic therapy may not outweigh the increased risk of major bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage. For patients with high-risk PE, also known as massive PE, the risk should be weighed against the benefit. So now, after examining the evidence behind thrombolytic therapy, we are now going to briefly discuss the thrombolytic agent that you are most likely to encounter or use in your clinical practice, Altaplace, also known as Recombinant Tissue Plasminogen Activator, or TPA for short. The indications for Altaplace include pulmonary embolism with hemodynamic instability, acute ischemic stroke, central venous catheter clearance, and ST elevation myocardial infarction. The mechanism of action for Altaplace is that it initiates the process of fibrinolysis by binding to fibrin within a clot and converting plasminogen to plasmin. Contraindications to Altaplace use include any active internal bleeding, history of stroke within the last three months, intracranial or serious head trauma, any known bleeding condition, or severe uncontrolled hypertension. The adverse effects of Altaplace include increased risk of hemorrhage at any site, nausea, vomiting, fever, and bruising. And the dosing of Altaplace for use in PE is 100 milligrams as an infusion over two hours. Parental anticoagulation should be initiated or resumed near the end of the infusion or immediately following the infusion when the patient's partial thromboplastin time or thrombin time is twice normal or less. So in summary, the ideal candidate for treatment of PE with thrombolytic therapy is a patient who is hemodynamically unstable and has an acceptable risk of bleeding, with hemodynamically unstable being a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 and the patient having an absence of bleeding risk factors. Additionally, thrombolytic therapy may be used in submassive PE as well, but the benefits to the patient should be carefully weighed against the risk of the therapy. The use is also regarded as an off-label use currently and is not endorsed by the CHESS guidelines.
These are the references for the presentation, and I hope that this presentation has been helpful to you in regards to knowing when to consider the use of thrombolytic therapy in patients with pulmonary embolism. Thank you for listening.